All right. Yes, it is. And I will start that presentation. Here's a button. Just a short reminder about the project. So we want about painting uh, analysis, verification, security requirements, uh, getting into tests and uh, uh, verifying operations. So um, with monitoring tools. Um, so uh, what we want actually, we want to address security from requirements to development and operations. Um, as you probably know, uh, the number of security vulnerabilities has grown dramatically uh, since uh, 2002. Uh, it's doubled since 2012 and going faster and faster. That's because of various uh, reasons, including that um, we have more and more software currently and more and more our world is run by software. Uh, also, uh, I mean, uh, we have uh, so many different specialists um, and not particularly is aware of security vulnerabilities and uh, the ways to deal with security. So um, to that, uh, we want to address uh, the security from the beginning, from requirement specification to development practices and to operations through various techniques. And just another example from the industry that's um, mostly like uh, vulnerabilities are uh, hardware, like network vulnerabilities, but also uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, progression in terms of application vulnerabilities. And among uh, then uh, those application vulnerabilities, we have lots of lots of critical vulnerabilities that uh, has to be ad addressed. Um, we think vulnerabilities and requirements are quite linked, and requirements many so. times. Um, See. Uh, um, yes, uh, Anna, hello. Oui. Let me continue. Uh, and requirements are the development of the systems and system operations. So, to say that, I mean, we see that uh, many systems are um, prone to security um, vulnerabilities, like 80%. 70% uh, have more than one vulnerability and 20% have more than 10 vulnerabilities. Right. So, um, very DevOps project. So we had the concept for this research project, whereas uh, we drive all analysis of the system through formal specifications. And um, we start with uh, some kind of uh, textual description, natural language uh, of security requirements, uh, vulnerability attacks, uh, attacks descriptions, vulnerabilities and attacks descriptions. Um, standards, but also requirements from the users. And through specific steps like natural language processing, formalization, we get into formal description of the systems and properties of the systems. And from that, we can automate many different things like um, at operations, uh, um, um, configure various monitoring tools to find out what are the uh, anomalies, what are the uh, attack, uh, attack signatures, and so on. Um, but uh, also in development stage, we can um, run design checks. So we can run and continuously um, verify and address the requirements. And uh, I believe your work will be somehow related to all these uh, various uh, topics. And uh, I guess this picture will, will, uh, would actually drive our um, uh, today's uh, seminar. Uh, so uh, we'll start with some of uh, the, um, the techniques. Uh, we'll go uh, through like uh, DevOps techniques uh, in the same context uh, through uh, monitoring techniques, testing techniques uh, to NLP. And so with that, we will see the whole picture, the whole uh, different uh, bits of research that we will feel uh, this picture. Okay. Um, so um, I guess that would be uh, end of my introduction. So I will give word uh, to our colleague, uh, Ildar. Ildar. Uh, yeah. 
you can share your screen. Uh -huh. um, um, one sec, please. Please let me know when you can mm -hmm. see my screen. Right. Um, just uh, just a small thing. Uh, any questions to, to this introduction presentation from anyone? Right. Um, if not, um, yeah, Eldar, you can you can start. Okay. Uh, thank you, Andre, and it's a, a good introduction. And my work is a part of the global thing that Andre uh, and our team is involved. And my focus and focus of my uh, PhD thesis is a requirements as a code. And uh, I consider functional and non-functional requirements. And uh, for next uh, 10, 15 minutes, I will talk about uh, what uh, issues I see, uh, what solutions I can propose and what possible benefits I can bring to industry. And uh, let me start from Introduction. Uh, currently, I'm a PhD student at Innopolis University. Also, I'm a teaching assistant and um, for uh, Innopolis as well. And in parallel, I'm a project manager in industry and uh, I have run a lot of projects for some big companies and some different domains and started from Microsoft also for government in Russia and banking in Europe and Russia. And my career started from QA engineering. And uh, that's my experience. It reflects the uh, topic that Andre uh, proposed me about half a year ago. And uh, when he talked about the uh, requirements as a code, and for example, he, his focus was on security requirements and it uh, reflects my uh, personal experience. And the first question that I asked myself, why security requirements are important? Uh, since uh, I started as a QA and uh, worked on QA engineering and quality assurance domain, and as a project manager, I worked a lot for banking and government, where security was the cornerstone for um, each business. And uh, any client asked us about, uh, how can you assure guys the security? Uh, and, and there, how can you guarantee that no personal data uh, will not uh, be leaked uh, somewhere and you have to avoid some um, backdoors? And in that case, we proposed a huge list of security requirements in um, technical specification. Uh, also, I started analysis of uh, some um, uh, vulnerabilities and some top. 12 uh, uh, to top, top 10 uh, uh, some security vulnerabilities and i see that for example broken x control some injections cryptography failures it happens and for now it's the most important thing in security uh, and also i saw the statistic uh, of the vulnerabilities and it uh, raised dramatically as you can see uh 2020 or one year is not ended and we see that uh, the magnitude is high and in that case i uh, thought about what what if i analyze security requirements for some uh, how to say specific uh, uh, domain and i pick up windows 10 operation system and security requirements for that uh, operation system and how can i structureize and uh, enhance them and it was on the upcoming slides how I can propose that case. But the second question, uh, what I ask myself is have to, it's a really challenge to ensure some uh, change request and require stability. Since uh, when we have a lot of, have to say in government, in banking domain, we have some changes in requirements, for example, in some uh, rules, compliance, etc., And we need to ensure that this part uh, is taking into account the source code and how to ensure that part, how we can guarantee to client that all his requirements uh, are stable, uh, not just in the code, but stable and, and uh, uh, robust and we can guarantee that it works correctly. And uh, when I analyze uh, some dozen of literature, uh, I find, 
find out the following things. First of all, uh, we need to simplify ways how to do that. Uh, we have out of date about 30 years old standards um, released by uh, Department of Defense in the mid of 18s. And uh, also I found out that there are a lot of incognito tools that uh, can guarantee some traceability between code and uh, requirements. And my change and my question was how we can uh, ensure that it can be applied to industry and we can simplify a way to uh, ensure traceability when we have a lot of codes, have to say more than one million uh, line of code and how can we apply some have to say pattern that can simplify and structurize these uh, requirements and uh, run it at a, so a, piece, a piece of code and uh, map uh, change the requirements and uh, code base. And the third change, and it reflects my experience as well in uh, how to support automation tests. Uh, sure thing, if we have uh, some small projects, it's, it's not a, a big deal to maintain. But what, what if we talking about more than one million line of code, right? And uh, what if we need some community tools and languages to apply for some test cases, you have to ensure traceability between test cases and requirements, some kind of uh, traceability matrix, but in terms of the code, uh, testing code base. And it was my third challenge. How can my, uh, our idea of patterns can guarantee that it can be simplified. And then the third thing that I'm going to verify in my uh, upcoming uh, PhD test. And uh, the solution that I can propose to industry in the area of analysis is the requirements uh, as the code patterns. Uh, first of all, let's uh, get back what's requirements. Uh, I consider both functional and non-functional requirements. Uh, just to refresh, if uh, you guys, someone uh, don't know, uh, for functional requirements, uh, what we put in the uh, requirements specification and we see the behavior of the system in terms of uh, its functionality, how it should work from user perspective, right? And non-functional, we uh, focus on attributes, a kind of performance, security, stability, maintainability, etc. So, uh, in my case, I consider both of them uh, since I uh, know that uh, both of them are described in the some list of uh, uh, list list of requirements, and they are, all have metrics, and I can structure them. That's why I cover both functional and non-functional. Uh, for that purpose, I uh, thought about different ways of how, how can I use uh, um, structure of required description, uh, how can be useful. And the first point is uh, what uh, caught my eyes is OP paradigm. Uh, so uh, I know that uh, OP paradigm, when I uh, was an automation tester many years ago, I use OP sometimes, and uh, uh, I know that it has inheritance, some polymorphism uh, principles, and uh, this thing can be applied to my patterns. Uh, let's say in a nutshell, for example, we have requirements. Let me, uh, so this is an um, example of security requirements for Windows 10. That's a uh, practical thing that I'm going to consider. And uh, this uh, in the left, column, we have IDs and severity and title, and each of these requirements for Windows 10 has its own, some parameters and its own, own structure. And what if I compare, uh, for example, pick up one requirements and compare it to another requirements? And I can make uh, some uh, parent class, some kind of uh, user account management, right? And these subclasses can be covered by my parent class. In that case, I can uh, create a parent class and see dependency between subclasses, right? And uh, for example, if I run some pattern that covers user account management, it covers uh, this all, all this subset of uh, subclasses uh, related to user account management. That's the point, guys. 
to simplify the way uh, how to uh, guarantee the uh, coverage and how to simplify these requirements. And uh, my also my point about test cases is to uh, find the way how can it simplify. And one of the areas of my uh, research is to consider uh, the tool called uh, Cucumber. Cucumber has its own natural language, uh, natural language to create a code for description of the test cases. That's the approach I'm going to take for my uh, for my work and apply it and see how, how can I uh, using the same OP paradigm and for example take a lot of test cases. How can I simplify find dependencies between test cases? Uh, test huge, for example, uh, huge blocks and uh, down to test cases and make these patterns. And uh, finally, uh, what benefits can I propose to the industry? That's my uh, primar primarily goal to uh, make some, bring some value for industry and not just paper for, for paper. It's for uh, real thing that's a uh, real change for me as a uh, industry representative. First of all, is simplify, require stressibility, uh, reduce time for test case support. And in my case, I'm going to not just to consider only stick requirements as a security, but consider another requirement security and see how can I uh, enhance security coverage, enhance the security overall for some systems. That's the point. That's it from my side. Thank you. Um, should you have any questions? Yeah, uh, okay. Um, just to recap, um, so um, this kind of a starting uh, point for this PhD thesis on requirements as a code. Um, so uh, Dar has just started uh, his thesis work and his few ideas on uh, where his plans to, to, to go. Um, okay, um, any, any questions from the audience? Um, Okay. Um, otherwise, uh, I propose we switch. Uh, I'm stop sharing. Thank you, Andrei. Yes. Thank uh, you, yes. everyone. Um, Olga Rufina would like to share. Okay, let it be me. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you see now mm -hmm. yes. my screen? Yes. Mm, okay, let's start. Uh, mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everyone. We are happy to present our semester thesis work that we have done. Uh, currently, we are a bachelor student, fourth year student, and this is the work for our thesis. Rufina. Uh, I'm giving the word to you. Okay, uh, here we would like to describe a software development life cycle uh, by stages. Uh, first stage is a requirement gathering from customers, so product owners. Um, the second stage is constructing some software requirement specification from that gather requirements. Afterwards, we construct uh, software architecture from this uh, document. Uh, the fourth step is uh, to design um, the code uh, from the software architecture. The fifth step is uh, to test our code. Uh, if some defects are uh, assigned to developers, uh, they should fix them. If the product is tested and uh, no failures uh, appear, then overall our software is developed, uh, is deployed into development environment where a customer can uh, observe how our software <clears throat> is performing. 
and if uh, customer is uh, happy with the results, we deploy this uh, software to the production environment. So, and in the production environment, if there are issues comes up, uh, there um, we report uh, these issues to customers and uh, fix our software. And uh, this uh, life cycle continues to repeat. So currently the tendency is to automate and uh, make this software development life cycle continuous. And uh, from this, we obtain uh, the CICD pipeline or in other words, DevOps pipeline. And there is the main reasons why we need automation and continuity. Uh, first of all, the quality of produced software increases and uh, also the speed increases. That is because the feedback loop from code production to getting some feedback on this code is decreased. So uh, developers could fix the bugs earlier and also continuous they think provide us with opportunity to monitor quality uh, more often. Uh, we can see here some tools and uh, that are mapped to stage. Uh, build stage is currently automated uh, with the use of such tools as Maven, Gradle, or simply uh, writing some shell script and executing it. Uh, also test stage is automated uh, via the same tools. And also we can perform container, Docker container scanning with uh, Trivi or Snook and perform static testing with Sonar. Uh, release stage is automated using uh, plugins in CICD platforms or if someone is not using the CICD platforms the same, we can just write shell script and execute it. Uh, deploy stage is basically automated by the use of uh, GitOps. So whenever there is a change in architecture or in uh, code in GitHub or any other version control tool, our architecture is changed and uh, our changes are deployed to development or to production. Uh, we can say that operate stage is automated via the use of load balancers. So whenever the load to your application is uh, increased, some other containers are raised and the load is uh, balanced between them. And when the load gets less, uh, containers get killed, so we do not use any um, resources more than we need. And monitoring stages uh, are automated by the use of different monitoring stacks. Uh, probably the most, the most uh, known is Grafana, Prometheus, and Alert Manager. So uh, looking at this CICD pipeline, we plan to achieve the transition from uh, requirements to the written tests. And this is going to be automated in CICD environment. Uh, let's take a look at uh, state of the art in literature review and uh, see why this task is not yet done by somebody else. Well, here I have chosen some uh, important papers from the field. And basically we can structure the three, uh, three general cases. Uh, first one, uh, the pre pre processing, some pre processing is required 
to build uh, test cases from requirements. Uh, second one, uh, other works produce uh, not readily executed tests. For example, the first one paper produces uh, abstract classes and the implementation itself should be written by developers. So this uh, code cannot be executed just from the start. And uh, also we can see that several papers are really domain specific. They are specific to autonomous, autonomous vehicles. And as the, well, as the researchers say, they plan to apply their approaches in the industry and see if it works there. So it is not even guaranteed to work in autonomous vehicles domain, and therefore it's not guaranteed to work in a general case. Okay, now uh, we want to present our methodology. Uh, we already refactored the code repository structure where uh, the source code and tests uh, for now are written uh, by manually by developers. Move uh, the whole project to Maven framework uh, to easily build and test it from the shell and create sample pipeline that runs all tests that uh, are present in the repository. For now, we are conducting feasibility study, which is in progress. And uh, we want to, um, the future work uh, is to create plugin for GitHub Actions for now that accepts simple trained ML model and some texts uh, as input data and return some predictions. Uh, and the further work is to apply our plugin to real ARCOT NLP model uh, that will be described further, I think, in further uh, presentations. Create additional plugin for parsing predictions from that NLP model and constructing Java tests from them. Here, our uh, pipeline, GitHub Actions pipeline mm, for now. Uh, when requirements uh, on the right, you can see the Git uh, repository structure, example. And uh, when requirements txt are modified in Git, for, for example, uh, customers or product owners want to add requirement or delete it, uh, say, um, is triggered for generating tests, new tests, uh, according to updated requirements. Then our plugin takes uh, NLP model and requirements as input and returns some predictions. Additional plugin takes that predictions as input, parse them and constructs Java tests. If predictions cannot be able to parse, then report is generated. Uh, then if everything is okay, Java tests are pushed to Git system tests folder. Uh, after the push of tests, then CI build is triggered. Uh, project uh, then is built and tested using Maven framework. Uh, if tests are not runnable, report is generated as well. If tests failed, report is generated because requirements. Uh, are not passed for our system. If no fail steps uh, occurred, then system is deployed to our server. So by this pipeline, we ensure that requirements are met uh, with our system. Here we observe some risks that we may face. First of all, uh, our pipeline may not be applicable. In general case for this, we decided to design CICD plugins for the most popular CICD platforms, for example, GitHub Actions, Jenkins, and CircleCI. Uh, the second risk is that uh, currently we do not have the transformer prototype that um, transform the requirements into Java test class. Uh, 
for this we agreed on the input and output format so that we do not stop our uh, work for prototype and the last one is uh, we should provide feedback if something fails in the pipeline and uh, actually this is the same as for applicability in CICD platforms uh, not everyone uses the same means to provide feedbacks and uh, in this case it is even uh, more complicated to agree on some general case so here we would appreciate some suggestions on how to uh, fix this well our secondary goal that we may achieve uh, during our research is comparison of ccd platforms uh, we can check is it easy to uh, develop some custom plugins on these CICD platforms. Uh, is this platform free for use on open source projects, on private projects, and also uh, check if there is limitations on resources, speed, flexibility, and so on. Uh, okay, uh, so currently we can say that uh, requirements generation uh, requirements to test generation optimization is not uh, largely represented in scientific community. Uh, we suggested a pipeline to employ the machine learning model for the purpose of transforming requirements into Java code test classes. And uh, Currently, we are going to show some demo of this pipeline, and uh, we would be glad if you suggest some improvements on our feasibility study. Uh, let's move to demo. Uh, okay. Uh, here we have two workflows. So first is the requirements push. So we have uh, specified the folder where we store the system requirements this is obvious uh, and whenever a new requirement arrives uh, we use uh, machine learning model emulator and uh, produce a test class from this requirement so as we said currently we do not have the actual machine learning model so we are using some python script just to emulate it and uh, these classes test classes are committed to uh, test folder the test folder is here src tests and some classes uh, the second workflow is gen is currently run on test push so whenever new tests arrive uh, all the tests are executed for now uh, let me stop uh, the workflow dispatch on push so that we do not do not miss uh, anything and uh, leave just manual dispatching Uh, also, here uh, we have requirements folder uh, with some requirements, and uh, as I showed, we have uh, Java tests. Uh, let us start from the beginning. So let's uh, delete all the requirements and all the tests. Also, it's worth to mention uh, what is performed in machine learning model emulator. So here I just uh, know which requirements I'm going to use. So here the requirements is just checked that uh, checked for uh, some patterns and according to these patterns Java classes are generated. Okay, let's delete tests also. Uh, 
so that the directory would be empty now. And let's start. Uh, I'm going to use this uh, Ubuntu stick. So this is the system specification. And here we can see how we uh, may check whether it is satisfied or not. Uh, Okay, our requirements folder is done. So uh, let me do the following. Hi, Olga. Um, I'm, I don't think we see your screen, so we just see kind of a fraction of a screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, let me share the whole uh, working process now. Do you see the screen now? Yes. So I created requirements folder. And now uh, let's add a requirement. Uh, we are going to use this one. Uh, so I'm going to copy the name. And I'm going to copy the whole content of this stick. We can see that uh, our Git repository is uh, updated now, so I'm going to commit this. Okay, everything is pushed. Uh, let's go here. We can see that requirements folder has appeared and we have this uh, stick here. And also if you go to actions, we see that uh, the action that should run on new requirements is triggered. And um, here we can see that we generated Java tests with this machine learning model emulator and committed these changes to SRC tests folder. Now let's check. Yes, the test has appeared 30 seconds ago uh, automatically. And now let's go to actions. I uh, turned off the automatic run of this uh, job. And now I'm going to trigger it manually. I'm running this workflow. And let's see what happens. So here we should check out the repository set up Java. And here we execute tests. As we see the tests have failed. So here, what we needed to check is uh, see whether the PAMLAST log file is present and uh, that it is set to required and no silent mode is present. So our test has failed and uh, we may see the file entry. As we can see, uh, 
PEMLESS block is set to optional. So this uh, violates this requirement and therefore our tests have failed. Uh, probably that is all for the demo part. Uh, we would really appreciate suggestions on how to improve this pipeline and how to conduct the feasibility study. And if you want to contact us, here's our university emails. Thank you for attention. Mm, thank you, Olga. Uh, thank you, Rufina. Uh, yeah, very nice presentation uh, that I first uh, the first time I see that. So it actually runs very smoothly and good. Uh, thank you. Um, so um, now from the audience, do you have any particular questions? Um, yeah. Yes, Andre. This uh, is Jean-Michel. Hi, Jean-Michel. Uh, yeah, very nice, uh, very nice uh, presentation. Very nice work. Um, I, uh, I'm just a little bit puzzled by the use of files. Uh, but I understand the, the the concept and everything. But um, in terms of traceability, uh, do you foresee a way to when when a test fail or when a test pass to somewhere um, in the list of requirements know which one have, have passed and which one have failed? Because I, I don't see. I mean, apart from reading some kind of report, I don't see a, a, a quick and easy way. If I have like uh, 15, 50 uh, files, 50 requirements files, which one, which one have passed, and which I mean, which one are satisfied, and which one are not. So I was, I was thinking at first using more issues, for example. Then you you would be able to tag the issues, or I don't know. But so how, my my question is, how how do you trace back to the requirements the fact that the the, the tests have failed? Only because the the, the push the push has failed or um uh, yeah, thank my, you my thank you for the question uh yeah yes you are right that uh, in case we have uh, more than like tens of requirements uh there is going to be a mess here and uh, actually we plan to uh, structurize them and uh, add some tags and uh, for now, this is a demo pipeline, so we didn't uh, add some enhanced uh, structure. And uh, also, as we mentioned here, uh, we are planning to provide feedback on the pipeline failures. So the feedback is going to be detailed and specify exactly which requirement has failed. And uh, for now, we did not come to an agreement of uh, how to generalize this feedback, like how to make it applicable in, in general case uh, so that it would be convenient for any user. Okay, thank you very much. Very nice suggestion, Michelle. So we'll be, be looking at, at this one uh, in the issues and the reports also, yeah. No, no, nice thing to, to, to look at. Um, any more questions or comments from the audience? Uh, Damir, uh, you are working also on DevOps uh, practices. Uh, so any comments on the demo? Yeah, not, not, not really. <laughs> not really, okay. So you- But, you, but you... yeah, but there, there might be something that, uh, like once I do my presentation, there mm. might be something that, could be interesting too. Mm -hmm. Perhaps okay. we could we could do something together. Okay, good, good. Thank you. Um, right, thank you very much, Olga Rufina. Okay, thank you. So Zuhani, we can switch to your presentation. So you some something. Uh, so Zuhani, are you here? Are you ready? Yes. Hello, everybody. Hello. Uh, can you see my screen? We can see you, but <laughs> me only. <laughs> okay. Uh, ta, ta, ta. Now? Yes. Okay. 
Well, hello everybody. This is Suhani Salazar from Montimash, and my presentation will be about security monitoring. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. Uh, I was born in Venezuela and currently I'm living in France. I'm a first year PhD student on security monitoring of 5G networks. This is an industrial PhD algorithm between Montimash, a small company based in Paris and the Université Paris-Saclay. I have a Master of Science in Computer Science for Communication Network of Telecom Sud Paris. And my background is in electronic engineering, telecommunications, and cybersecurity. I'm currently working in two European projects, um, Bird DevOps for monitoring industrial control systems, and um, Sankus project for monitoring 5G networks, where I'm actually doing my PhD thesis. The presentation plan of today is, first of all, a motivation about why it is important to perform a security monitoring. Then I will provide you with some uh, basic con concepts about uh, monitoring, including the different approaches of the industrial of the intrusion detection systems. Then I will talk about the work I, I've been doing and General Montimash will be doing in the very developed project. And then I will give you a short pitch about my thesis. Why monitoring? First of all, I would like to present you some insights provided by Kaspersky, an important actor in the cybersecurity. They study the current state of industrial cybersecurity in the area of digitalization and in particular after the current coronavirus pandemic started in 2020. Uh, first of all, they ask to industrial companies uh, if they think their Operation technology cybersecurity priorities has changed uh, after the pandemic started. And 46% of the companies said that probably yes. And even more, Kaspersky uh, reported that the number of phishing cyber, cyber attacks uh, went up since Mars, uh, March 2020. It is uh, still early to determine the reasons of this, but Kaspersky and some publications uh, states that this can be due that the people, people that wasn't prepared or haven't received any information to work remotely is starting to do so, and in many times with their own equipment. So the surface of attacks has increased, and in general, the number of vulnerabilities, because in many times the equipment, the personal equipment of the employees of a company are not properly prepared to perform teleworking in a secure way. They, for example, in many times they do have uh, antivirus, firewalls, or even more the employees could make mistakes like, for example, decide to work remotely uh, from a public network like in a Starbucks coffee. So it is important that employees should be frequently trained to perform this kind of remote work and the technology has to change to meet the security requirements of this extreme situation. Another insight that this report of Kaspersky presents is what, what are um, the main cybersecurity challenges considered by the companies? First of all, 32% uh, of the company answered that the injury or death of employees. Another common answer was the damage of their product or and service quality, the loss of proprietary and confidential information, and the cost of the incident response and mitigation. So now we can see that cybersecurity is not only a big priority now more than even that, that ever, but also that is closely related with the safety of the employees, the quality of the products and services offered by a company the loss of, uh, of confidential information, and even more that the incident response is a big challenge and is very important because it can, it, it can mean uh, cost in terms of loss of the customer confidence and the, in general, the quality of the products and services offered. And the main way to actually have a quick incident response is to perform a proper security monitoring of the systems. Finally, um, 
Kaspersky asked to the companies why, what they consider the, are the technical trends that have a stronger impact in their cybersecurity. Many of them answered that the use of industrial IoT components, the adoption of cloud or and software as a service technologies, the use of machine learning and in general uh, artificial intelligence technologies, and the adoption of 5G communication networks. So as we know, new technologies necessarily come with uh, new vulnerabilities and this impacts the cybersecurity. So to summarize, why is important to perform monitoring security? Because as the last three presentations said, there is an important increase uh, of the amount of vulnerabilities and Kaspersky has also reported that their severity is increasing too. Is increasing too. Then, because companies, industry is adopting new technologies and these games with new vulnerabilities. And finally, because the reaction time is crucial in these cases. So let's see what is actually security monitoring. But first of all, I would like to present you these three basic concepts of cybersecurity. A vulnerability, which is a weakness that can be exploited by cyber, crimin uh, cyber criminals. This a vulnerability is not actually making any damage in, the, in a system, but if it is exploited or leveraged by a malicious actor or by accident, it can actually make a damage. This is a threat. A threat is actually the exploitation of the use of this vulnerability to cause a damage in the system. Both vulnerabilities and threats can be introduced by accidents or on purpose by a cyber criminal. Finally, a cyber attack, which is obviously always, always made on purpose, is any offensive maneuver that targets damage a computer information system, a computer network, an infrastructure, etc. And in general, cyber attacks violate completely or partially one of the three principles of the cybersecurity. The availability of the system, that means that it is able to serve its purpose and that its information, its data, is always available for the users. For example, a denial of service attacks uh, impacts the availability of a system because the legal users cannot access to it anymore. The confidentiality, which is the property that the information is must not be a available or disclosed by unauthorized individuals. And the integrity, that is the property that say that data cannot be modified by unauthorized actors. So what is uh, security mon monitoring? Is the fact of observing, observing or inspecting a network system application uh, a network system or application at different points in order to detect malicious activity or policy violations. In general, one of the most basic tools to perform security monitoring is uh, the, an intrusion detection systems. And these tools follows mainly two approaches. They are signature base, uh, based or anomaly based. Let's see in detail these two approaches. Signature-based intrusion detection systems, they monitor events in a system and compares them with patterns or signatures that describe good properties, good security properties that must be respected, or attacks or and threats that we want to avoid. Important to say that this information is safe in a database. So we to perform signature-based uh, intrusion detection, we must first of all create a database with the patterns and the signatures we want to monitor in the system. These signatures are security properties or rules. And as I say, they can describe good behaviors. And in this case, the non-respect of the security properties would mean an anomal behavior and potentially an attack or a threat into the system, for example, the access of a specific service must always be preceded by an authentication phase. Or on the other hand, the security property can describe a malicious behavior uh, an attack, that can be an attack, a threat, or in general, a misbehavior. And in this case, the respect of these security properties will indicate, will trigger an alert. For example, a big number of requests from the same user in a limited period of time 
can be considered as a potential denial of service attack. The main advantages of the signature-based intrusion detection systems are that once they are installed, they can perform very quick detection. And in general, you install them and they are ready to be used. They don't have to, they don't need a learning phase to learn the behavior of the system. The disadvantages are that a simple modification of attack of an attack could make it undetectable. And more complex the rules, more demands uh, in, we, we will have in terms of processing. And also that in general, as the rules try to be as general as possible, the signature-based detection, intrusion detection system can generate a lot of false positives. One of the main challenges of, uh, to this approach is in the case of monitoring uh, security in networks specifically, is how to identify attacks that span across several packets and how we can identify attacks or misbehaviors by preserving at the same time the privacy of the user. Some uh, example of IDS, in this case uh, only for networks, are the open source solutions uh, called SNORT, Surikata, or SIC before called BRO. And in Montimash, we also have our IDS called Montimash Monitoring Tool that I guess many of you know already. Um, the other approach is called anomaly detection. In this case, the IDS will have to have a learning phase where it will learn the normal model of the system. And then when in the monitoring phase, any substantial deviation of this uh, define a normal model will be considered as an anomaly that can be translated to a potential intrusion or attack into the system. As I said, we need to learn the normal model of the system. A very common technique using in this kind of IDS are of course machine learning and in general artificial intelligence techniques, but also another statistical basis or knowledge based methods are used. In, in the advantage of this uh, approach, we have that we can detect new attacks uh, as the only information we need is actually the normal behavior of the system. And also we can help the rule, we can use anomaly detection to help a rule, uh, rule basis IDS to reduce the rate, if rates of its uh, false positive. Between the disadvantages are that is in general lay security this accurate that the signature based intrusion detection system where we actually have defined it very detailed the misbehavior we want to detect in the challenges uh, and these challenges are more related with the machine learning anomaly detection detection is first of all as in all machine learning application we did data, good data, and lots of it to be able to learn properly the good behavior of the system. Also, in, in general, we need to make the good choice related with our case study of the algorithm that we are going to use. And in general, we need to be able to generalize our model to make it applicable to different use cases and avoid what is called overfitting in machine, in machine learning. What we're going to do actually in very DevOps is first, we're going to study how to include the security in the DevOps process, how to go from a raw requirement to a formalized security requirement by using NLP techniques as exposed in the last two presentations to transform these formalized security requirements in a security property that we actually can use to may perform rule-based and an anomaly-based uh, monitoring of the system. So this is basically the methodology, the framework we're going to be using in Montimash in the case of the very developed projects. We're going to take traces, network that this can be application logs or network traces of our use case studies provider. We're going to extract from their logs 
important relevant events or features that we're going to use to perform rule-based monitoring, machine learning-based anomaly detection, and another technique we call root cause analysis that allow us to, when an incident happens, to determine its potential origin. And finally, we're going to take all these results and make interesting, relevant plots and charts to inform the relevant people when an incident occurs, and in general, the current status of the network or the application that we were studying. Uh, a short example of what we're doing is the ABV case study, where we have to identify if the measurements performed by certain sensors are valid or not. To do this, we will perform monitoring. And some interesting research question uh, we're studying in this case study is how can we improve security and safety of an industrial system with my doing the security monitoring techniques I just present to you. Also, how re reliable is the use of machine learning in industry compared with the algorithm that they already have implemented? Uh, in the case of ABB uh, case study, we're using machine learning, we're using a multi-layer perceptor classifier to classify the measures made by a sensor into valid or invalid. We are using certain features that are very specific of the case study. And the data set we're using is a data set provided at ABB what, that we have split, I think in the proportion 75% and 25% to perform the training phase and the testing phase. And as, as we can see, as you can see, we're uh, obtaining very interesting results in terms of accuracy, recall, and precisions of the classification. This is a still work in progress. And as I said, one of the main challenges of us in this moment is to be able to generalize enough this model to avoid overfitting. Finally, I would like to present you what is my thesis. It is called Security Testing and Monitoring of Cloud Native 5G Networks. It is supervised by Professor Anne Cavalli of IP Paris, but Fatia Saidi of Université Paris-Seclay and Madhuisa Manuli of Montimash. In my thesis, I will perform mainly, uh, basically the same methodology I just present to you for monitor for bird devils, but not in industrial contract system, but in 5G networks. So the idea here will, will in general, we will have three main stages of the thesis. First of all, to perform a penetration testing to propose uh, some kind of attacks into the propers of uh, 5G networks. For this in Montimash, we have developed an open source tool uh, called 5G Replay that you can check on GitHub that allows us to perform fuzzing testing into 5G networks. And then the idea is to perform the same monitoring techniques I just present to you to be able to detect the attacks proposed in the uh, previous stage. And finally, uh, propose some countermeasures for these attacks. Uh, these are the references I used to make to prepare this presentation. And thank you all for your attention. I will be happy to answer your question. Okay, thank you very much, Johanny. So very interesting, um, very informative presentation. Um, so um, any questions from the audience? Uh, Um, so otherwise, I have uh, some small question, question. So we had slide 15, and you mentioned properties and resources. Uh, do you have, um, do you need any specific like formal model for resources? I mean, to make your properties uh, uh, working. All right, so you're, you're, you're checking monitoring techniques are working. So uh, I, I think it was kind of an example that you mentioned uh, that uh, like, uh, uh, some resources should be uh, available after authentication. Uh, um, so so um, uh, what kind of like, um, do you need a resource model for that? Or kind of, uh, what, what, what kind of things you need as a kind of input for your uh, monitoring tool in terms of uh, system de description? I think in, in monitoring in general, we don't work uh 
by assuming we know the, the system, what we need to actually know is the security requirements we want to achieve, we want to meet. So what we actually will need is very clear security requirements. Like for example, the two examples I have here, like in our system, for example, ABD systems were interesting in monitor if the is each access to our services are always preset by an authentication phase. What mm -hmm. we need is that statement, the security requirement mm -hmm. or an attack that we want to avoid. We in Fagor case study, for example, were very interested in detect uh, potential denial of services attacks uh, mm -hmm. the, in this server. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, great. thank you. Um, any, any other questions from the audience? Uh, I have one question. Mm -hmm. uh, it's on the on the slide where uh, Johanny presented this um, a case study with ABB. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned uh, this solver, uh, this, uh, I think it was abbreviation of something. Uh, I was wondering what was this, this, uh, on this hidden, under this hidden layer, this IBFTS solver. These are parameters of the, of the classifier. Uh, in this moment, I'm not able to, to give you details about, about it. And then how, how do you uh, deal with the this Im imbalance classification? Because I think you have lots of uh, valid, but not many invalid. Yeah, that was a big problem. Well, it's a still a, a challenge because we have exactly in the um, traces provided by AVV, there are lots of valid measurements but very few number of invalid measurements. In this case, what I, what I did, was to combine data sets and then shuffle them. And in that case, in, in that case I had the same amount of um, bad cases, invalid measurements and valid measurements. And then the features I took, they are not related with the configuration of the system. In that case, to, to, make able, to be able to combine the data sets. Because of course, if we are combining data set and at the same time, we are using features that depends on the system, the, the implementation doesn't have uh, many sense. But again, this is a, a still work in progress. We need to, and uh, we're we are getting very good results, both by checking it in the data set divided. The idea would be also to have very good results by checking this in a completely new data set. And well, this is uh, a still work in progress. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, okay. A any more questions? Uh, anyone? No comments? Okay, then, uh, Zuhani, thank you very much uh, for this nice presentation. Uh, so, I guess in our agenda, we have a small uh, break. Uh, let's take um, about 10 minutes and then we will come back. Uh, with more presentations and uh, uh, it will be a return from the OBLA Academy uh, to present uh, the work. So we will ask uh, Gadha to uh, talk about the metamorphic testing approach. Uh, right, so let's take 10 minutes, okay? Uh, and uh, we're at uh, 11.23, let's say, uh, uh, European time. Okay.
Okay, um, should be going back. Um, right, uh, Galha, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Hi, right, hello. Uh, yeah, you can share your screen. Um, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I, I believe we can start. Uh, yes, we can mm -hmm. start. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Gatha. I'm a research student at uh, Ubo Academy University. Uh, I'm from India and uh, uh, currently living in Finland. And uh, I have completed my master's uh, this summer and uh, now in the first phase of my research studies. And uh, I'm working on a tool to develop a tool-based approach for automation of metamorphic testing. The motivation for the research uh, is uh, aligned with the goals of the Very DevOps project. Uh, we need uh, improved verification and uh, validation mechanism for uh, software systems. And uh, for this, uh, to develop uh, tools for functional and uh, non-functional testing of industrial control systems and to a possible extent implement automation of these testing techniques uh, for verification of uh, security requirements. In uh, recent times, we hear reports about cyber attacks on uh, software systems. And uh, to avoid such security vulnerability exploitations, uh, we should adopt uh, smarter te testing techniques. And well, the challenge here is to uh, the complexity of the uh, large scale industrial systems. And uh, we are often limited by uh, the effectiveness of the testing techniques and uh, problems such as test or echo problem. And a solution for this uh, test oracle problem uh, is metamorphic testing. In metamorphic testing, uh, in this approach, we execute the system with different set of inputs. And uh, uh, we formulate metamorphic relations which are identified from the software specification. And then we compare the output of these different executions with different set of inputs and derive, uh, test the system uh, to detect any anomalies or possible defects. Metamorphic testing has already been applied to uh, test specific problem domains. And uh, among the most popular ones are uh, to test uh, web services and applications computer graphics, simulation and modeling, and embedded system. One example from a case study or research uh, is that we can, we can also use metamorphic testing to enhance security testing. And uh, where we have this, we are facing the test oracle problem, and we can, we can use this to detect web failures. And metamorphic testing also enables negative testing of uh, security related functionality. And we can derive uh, metamorphic relations from security requirements and use it for security testing. So an example would be uh, detecting a login failure in an internet banking website. So in this case, uh, a simple metamorphic relation uh, is used to test when different users log on to a local computer using different usernames, they should always be able to follow the same steps to navigate to the website and click on the internet banking login button. So here you can see that uh, uh, when, when they tested, they detected a failure. When they used a different uh, user account, uh, they, they, they did not get the same web internet banking login page. And currently there are uh, techniques 
or approaches to systematically create metamorphic relations. And one such, one such approach is to uh, combine the existing metamorphic relations and form a uh, meta new metamorphic relation, which can be used for testing. And this approach would uh, reduce the testing effort and time. And there are machine learning based methods and methods to automatically infer uh, polynomial metamorphic relations using a tool known as metamorphic relation inferrer. And as per a recent survey on metamorphic testing, the tools that are available currently are both Java based tools. One is JFIRST for the unit testing of Java classes. And the other one is also based on Java modeling language runtime, runtime assertion checking. So in, in, in our case study, we are dealing with the position control system to determine the position of, uh, um, uh, of the load using positional markers. So this system receives as input data coordinates from a camera module. And these uh, input comprises of points that are corresponding to positional markers. And it, it could also have noise in the frame corresponding to reflections from the environment. And system would generate an in, uh, output indicating if the actual markers are identified or not. So in, in the metamorphic testing approach, we are generating a source test case based on the input that we received from uh, our industrial partner as a data log. So this input is a positive test case where it contains only the actual positional marker coordinates. So in that case, the system would generate an output which is like true for all the input records in the log. And in our approach, we create an uh, input which comprise of the actual markers and noise which are uh, generated uh, in a, uh, a semi-random way as an invalid input to the system. So we are trying to fuss the system uh, for negative testing. And in case of the uh, uh, output input that we created, we expect that the system shall identify the positional markers correctly. And the metamorphic relation that is formulated is that the output of the first execution and the next execution should be identical. Based on the initial results that we get, uh, we, we, it indicates that the metamorphic re relation is violated and it could possibly uh, reveal a defect that the system is failing to identify the uh, valid patterns and the noise. So the advantages of this testing approach is that uh, this enables a feedback-based program evolution, and it could also help the industrial partners for their future regression testing of the system. And currently, the research challenges in metamorphic testing um, are, to, are to develop strategies for uh, generating good metamorphic relations and to apply the prioritization and minimization to reduce the number of metamorphic relations that are identified, to end up with good ones uh, to enable effective testing. And also there is a need to uh, uh, create automated test generation and test execution approaches. And currently in public domain, there are very less metamorphic testing tools that are available for the researchers. So this is the research plan uh, for my research studies. And uh, I have referenced the following materials. Thank you. I, I, I'm not able to hear you. Uh, we can hear you, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess if there are any questions. Uh, I have a question. In the example that you have done, uh, provide, 
Uh, yeah. You mentioned that you have defined a metamorphic relation that doesn't work for the markers. Uh, how do you plan to modify in order to obtain a correct uh, metamorphic relation? Uh, we formulated a metamorphic relation and uh, when the metamorphic relation is violated, we, we end up with a uh, test verdict that uh, the system may uh, system failed to um, satisfy that metamorphic relation. So uh, the metamorphic relation that we formulated uh, is based on the specification. The system is supposed to identify the valid markers in all cases. The system should ignore the noise. So the metamorphic relation is based on the specification, but uh, in the test execution, it violated the metamorphic relation. And that is what is revealing the fault in the system. I hope I... Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question too. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's very basic, um, but what do you think is the difference between the metamorphic testing and the fossil testing? Uh, uh, the only difference is that metamorphic testing uses these metamorphic relations and uh, it, it is kind of an enable, it enables the negative testing. And uh, uh, to decide the test verdict, we are using this metamorphic relation. Whereas uh, in first testing, is, it is just uh, fussing with invalid inputs. There's no concept of metamorphic relation or a violation of a metamorphic relation to prove the test or uh, to, to predict the test result. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I can add a bit more here that uh, yeah, in this approach that uh, uh, we use uh, sort of fuzzy testing to check the metamorphic relationship, but it's not uh, uh, mandatory or th this is not the only way to check the metamorphic relationship. So there can be other ways to check the metamorphic relationship. So in that, so the metamorphic testing, we are mainly concerned about the relation that it should satisfy and then how we generate the follow-up test cases, it's, uh, it's up to the tester or the developer that how he came up with a follow-up test case. So it's not that we are restricted only to fuzzy. Thank you. Andre, we cannot hear you. Uh, hello, do you hear me? Hello? Yes. 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 Um, yeah, I, I, I still have a naive question about uh, uh, this metamorphic uh, relationships, uh, relations. Um, so can you give a naive example uh, to me about so what's, uh, what it is? So, uh, uh, is it some, something if, um, for example, this holds for one example, it should hold for all both uh, like typical examples? So what, what, what it is? If you want, I, I can give you an example. Yes. Uh, so let's say you are booking a hotel uh, or you are looking for hotels to book in, in France. And you go to booking.com and you search for all the hotels in France and you get a list of hotels. And then you are searching also for all the hotels in Paris. Yeah. And you get a list of hotels from Paris. Mm -hmm. And the metamorphic relation here is that the hotels in Paris should be included, all of them in the hotels in France. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Other way, some, otherwise, otherwise something is wrong. Mm -hmm. And for instance, there has been uh, an example at uh, I, I think at Spotify, where they were searching for certain criteria uh, within the data, music database. Mm 
mm -hmm. and they would get a list. Mm -hmm. And if they would search for the same criteria, but they ordered the list differently, or yeah, they asked for the results differently in a different order, then the list was different, which means that simply by sorting, uh, the results were different than the original one. So that was a metamorphic relation. I mean, when you search for the same results, regardless if they are in which order they are, the two, the two results should be identical. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Okay, uh, so, so it's um, trying to guess the, the category for, for a kind of a set of queries. Okay, so to, to keep this kind of logical a, relationship. Yeah, it, it's just a logical uh, uh, relationship between the, the outputs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and any more questions uh, from the audience? So, um, yeah, okay, so then we will switch uh, to uh, more presentations. And so our next presenter will be uh, Evan Fia, uh, from also from ABA Academy. Uh, yep, Evan Fia, you can join. And uh, Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, us. then uh, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, now you should be able to see my screen. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so my name is Evanfia. Uh, I'm a master's student at Obo Academy University. Um, and uh, my master's thesis work concerns um, web client test transfer. Um, yeah, so I will get right into it. So um, basically my work concerns um, testing of graphical user interfaces and such testing can be manual or automatic. And automated testing is defined for the purposes of my work uh, is the one that emulates human interaction with a <clears throat> system under test. Um, nevertheless, um, there is also manual testing, and uh, although it's very costly and time-consuming and labor-intensive, it's still widely used. Uh, according to uh, research literature, uh, it is sometimes even the preferred option um, due to a very high maintenance effort associated with automated testing. Um, so there are certain challenges um, of automated graphical user interface and testing that basically uh, because of those challenges um, we still have manual testing. Uh, basically when our system changes uh, very often test execution breaks and um, according to research uh, one of the most common causes for such failure is uh, basically that um, it's impossible to locate um, graphical user interface widgets, uh, maybe because their locators changed, for example. Uh, and uh, research suggests that more robust identification of graphical user interface widgets could um, basically uh, <laughs> tackle this challenge of automated testing. Uh, there are other challenges associated with uh, automated testing. For example, if we use crawling of graphical user interfaces, um, it's very time consuming, it's very slow. And uh, such tests also lack context aware inputs. Uh, so they basically do not necessarily emulate human interaction very well. Um, so there has been uh, a very recent proposed solution, which is called semantic mapping or matching, depending like it's the same thing in the literature. And this idea was first proposed, uh, as far as I know, in 2018. And the idea is that uh, if we have applications, let's say in the same domain, uh, such applications often have similar functionality. And since they have similar functionality, they also, their user interfaces can be quite similar, uh, although they might be perhaps using different uh, text attributes to signify the, like the same elements, but they nevertheless perform the same function. Like for example, in, in, in this kind of like uh, uh, drawn example, uh, we have uh, two uh, authentication forms and they perhaps um, might have different names, use different labels, but they nevertheless perform the same thing. 
Um, so the research in this area uh, has been mostly developed for web applications and mobile applications. And the idea has been that we can um, harness information from neighboring elements to identify um, corresponding um, web user elements uh, between different applications. Um, so the research suggests it can be done between applications in the same domain. Um, but nevertheless, in my case, I'm working on test transfer between uh, different versions of the same application, meaning that uh, when system is updated and our locators perhaps changed, um, we still can perform testing without test execution failing due to changes. Uh, so how exactly can it be done? So, um, um, so basically, um, my task of uh, test transferring can be uh, broken down into several steps. So the first step being is once we have, um, so it's done using um, basically Selenium web driver. So once we have a web application um, in Selenium web driver, uh, what is done first is that uh, um, this is like the solution parses uh, like uh, HTML and it extracts uh, all graphical user elements XPath and their corresponding attributes. So for example, such attributes could be text, IDs, values, um, their position. And um, for, for example, for images, there could be alternative text. Um, the next step is embedding such attributes for further clustering. So um, <clears throat> I use deep embedding. Uh, I use um, one of the uh, BERT models for it called SBIRT. So uh, I treat such embeddings as uh, sentence level embeddings. Uh, and after that, I apply uh, a semi-supervised clustering technique. Um, I have tested quite a lot of them, but one of them is like k-means and um, self-organizing maps and also label propagation. Um, and the next step in the test transfer procedure is actually finding matching uh, graphical user interface widgets for test transfer. So uh, once we have deep embedded text-based attributes, uh, we match them against uh, clusters uh, in another version uh, and find the one with the highest cosine similarity score. Uh, so the way it works, it works as follows. So uh, first of all, let's say we have a web page and um, using Selenium, uh, we extract um, attributes which are then uh, needed for embeddings. Uh, such attributes are concatenated and embedded using BERT, which is sentence level BERT. Uh, then thus, these embeddings are fed into a semi-supervised uh, self-organizing map and clusters are obtained. And I have to, I have to point out that uh, each cluster contains only one widget. So uh, there are at least as many clusters as there are widgets on the page. So cosine similarity here is actually um, like similarity between two vectors. So we use here uh, sentence level vectors. So these are not word and not document, but on this level it's sentence. Um, <clears throat> so then again, we also need to find like corresponding pages between different versions. And here again, I use cost and similarity. So I use document level embeddings, and then I find the matching ones with the highest cost and similarity score. Uh, so once corresponding screens are found, uh, their clusters are compared and the ones with the highest similarity are matched. Um, so uh, I think I have here a small, quite like work in the progress example, but this is how it would look like. So once we have, um, like we, we find corresponding pages and now we have to find corresponding clusters that contain uh, our widgets. So 
we compare them and the system finds the one with the highest cost and similarity score. Uh, as I have already mentioned, uh, each cluster contains only one widget, uh, which is an interactable element. So for example, a link, an input form, a button. Um, and testing is implemented in Python using Selenium. And once we find a corresponding cluster, we use existing tests for uh, our uh, graphical user interface widget. So um, basically we use, for, for, for locating widgets, we use uh, absolute expats. Um, so how would I evaluate this technique? So uh, in research literature so far, accuracy has been the most popular metric for evaluating this. So we would, for example, we would know um, basically the correct uh, uh, corresponding uh, uh, web user interface elements, and we can compare whether uh, like the proposed solution will actually find those corresponding elements or not. Um, also, precision and recall have been used. Um, but in my master thesis, I uh, have had to compare um, basically uh, many models for many steps. So for example, for including like the clustering step. So um, for evaluating um, the proposed solution, I also will evaluate um, different clustering techniques and different parameters for these techniques to find the one which is the most appropriate, though, of course, it is very hard to say what would be the most appropriate. Um, also, multiple bird models are evaluated for embeddings. There exist a lot of uh, bird models which are pre-trained uh, language models. Uh, and they, of course, of course, also produce different results. Um, yeah, so the next page is the references. Uh, there have been lots of challenges in my work and uh, it is not, not yet done. <laughs> One of the challenges has been with the, with the clustering because first I uh, treated this um, grouping of web elements task as a, as a supervised problem. So um, I tried to find uh, some data which I could use to train a model that would, for example, um, classify web elements into different, um, into different groups related to their function. But unfortunately, it's quite hard to obtain such uh, like public data that wouldn't have any like copyright issues with it. Another issue, of course, is um, it's, it's hard to test uh, such technique uh, without um, having some industry um, available applications that could be basically used for testing. So I'm quite limited to like public options, whatever is in public domain. Uh, yeah, so these have been some challenges and issues along the way, uh, but um, like, the existing research shows that uh, the whole idea of test transfer is quite promising, uh, although it has been done on mobile applications for the most part so far, but um, it, it, it seems to suggest that um, it saves a lot of time, <laughs> basically, in testing and produces more context-aware inputs for testing uh, because they are not random. Uh, yeah, so this is a promising area of research, mm -hmm. and uh, these are some of the references I used in my um, in my presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting, very um, uh, surprising techniques for using NLP for testing. Um, any questions from the audience? Uh, so otherwise I have a question from my side. Um, so um, I, I noticed uh, um, like sentence extraction. So especially in the example, um, the sentences are kind of a number of um, labels, not kind of uh, full sentences, right? So if you can back to the example, please. Um, yeah, so. yeah. I mean, it's 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 a kind of like working. Uh, it's an example from my demo, so I mm -hmm. I doubt it's going to be. 
Oh, it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. So, yeah, yeah. These are these are labels, and they are concatenated. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I treat them as sentence level embeddings. And why I do that is that there actually has been a very recent study, like I think published like a month ago, which compares different embeddings for uh, the task of um, test transfer for the semantic matching. And they compared, for example, word to web, which is like word level embeddings uh, with contextualized embeddings. And what they found is that document and sentence level embeddings are more precise for this task than mm -hmm. word level embeddings. Because different, uh, because there were several techniques proposed in this area of semantic matching and they use different word representations. Uh, most of them use word to act actually. Mm -hmm. Because at the time when this research originated in 2018, that's what still was used. But I think by this time, Bert, basically kind of um, is the most state of the art solution we have in natural language processing as a pre-trained solution. So mm -hmm. yeah, so this is why I use I use this. Of course, the, the risk would be one way to maybe compare word to act to maybe like word level embeddings to sentence level. Mm -hmm. Um, and see what, what would produce, but this is what uh, like the current research suggests so far. Okay, okay, interesting. Um, also, in terms of example here, uh, how you would interpret the uh, various numbers for cuisine similarity here, uh, like an example number uh, nine, no, no, no 18, 89. So it seems uh, so cuisine is 62% uh, or something. Um, and then yeah. it seems to be similar. So and then we have like since similarity nine when there is user name mentioned, so it should be some kind of, somehow very 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 close. Um, so how 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 would you would um, compare those? Um, um, well, basically, because uh, yeah. Uh, well, basically, cosine similarity works in a way that uh, the more similar the, the the vectors are, the higher it is. So it's the interval, the normally it's like between minus one and one, so closer mm -hmm. to one, the most similar it is. But I think that uh, many proposed solutions, they use a certain kind of threshold. Mm -hmm. uh, and But they don't all, you, all use cosine similarity. They also, some of them use like Levenstein di distance, for example. Mm -hmm. So this is another thing uh, that I consider to, because I, I have been also trying different kind of measures of similarity to include in my thesis, this kind of comparison to find which one is the best. But uh, in most of the cases, cosine similarity is used and it's quite easy as, as a metric. It's very easy. It's very understandable for humans and mm -hmm. because it re just represents similarity between vectors. So. So how would you interpret that? Uh, which are the similar, given this example, which are the similar ones and which are Less well, similar, similar, dissimilar. dissimilar. Uh, yeah, well, we actually can see that the very last one, it's its obviously perhaps um, yeah, I mean, certain really. that shouldn't be there. It has number one, mm -hmm. so it's the same. And the most dissimilar one, I, I guess it's uh, uh, this 176. It's this welcome back and then mm -hmm. completely unrelated. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so we can see they are not very related, really. Mm. Uh, but but I would still yeah so uh, perhaps there should be a certain threshold um, above which we should consider that something is similar and something is less similar. But I think it's quite hard to work out this threshold in reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, but but I I guess there should be certain certain something. Yeah, but we can find for example um, example one hundred and four. Uh, with cosine similarity uh, 0 0.59 mm -hmm. and it corresponds for example if you're not registered please continue by I think creating an account and the other no account join us which are essentially the same things what it suggests yes. to the yes. user is that they don't have an account and they need to continue by creating one right mm -hmm. so although we can see here that absolutely different words are used to describe the same thing Mm -hmm. um, the cosine similarity works quite well here, embeddings work quite well here because it still finds those uh, as having the highest cosine similarity. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Thank you very much. I think it's a very interesting example. Um, any more questions from the audience, uh, please? Mm -hmm. So um, in this case, uh, thank you very much. A very interesting um, presentation. We'll have another presentation on clustering by Nikita at the end of this uh, session. Uh, now we uh, switch to uh, uh, Millard Dalen and Mikhail would present his uh, ideas and his research on test automation frameworks. Um, Mikhail, uh, you may share your screen. Hello, yes, uh, let me just share my screen. Can you see my presentation? Um, you can see your screen. Probably you have the double screen. We have another. This is presentation. Yeah. Now we, we see it. Now you can see. Okay. Uh, let me just sort it. And we have presenter mode, not the display settings. To go display settings. No, no, display settings. Uh huh. And switch the active uh, screen. Yes. Also, that presenter, yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, <coughs> hello, everyone. I I'm Mikhail Ibrahim Salari from uh, Maladaran University. In this short presentation, I want to talk about uh, what I did to the moment and uh, what is our future work. So the title of my presentation is towards the use of automated test generation for finding faults and vulnerabilities in industrial PLC software. Here is some information, personal information about me. Uh, my name is obviously Mikhail Ibrahim Salari. I'm 29 years old and uh, I'm from Iran. Uh, and my city name is uh, Mashhad. Uh, if I want to give you some information about my education, I have a Master of Science in Information Technology Engineering, Computer Networks. And the title of my master thesis is automated, uh, is uh, Android malware detection using ensemble classification and sample, sample clustering. I also hold a, a BSc in Computer Software Engineering from Islamic Azad University of Mashhad, and I also have a high school diploma in mathematics. My research experience is more about computer networks, especially uh, Internet of Things, industrial Internet of Things, and software-defined networking. I also have some background in the field of network security, Software security and software testing, automated test case generation. I also have some background that are related to my master thesis uh, about malware detection and ensemble classification and data mining, especially clustering sampling techniques like uh, k-means and x-means. My work experience is more about is more tied with IT support in several internet service providers in Iran, my country, including Mobinet, ICFTEC, Corazon uh, Telecommunication Company, and uh, so on. I also have some background in uh, about uh, being uh, an IT specialist in Hassan Watts Razavi Corporation and Jafar Jam Corporations in my country, and I was also. Uh, an expert in economic affairs in receiving claims section of Mashan Municipality. Let's uh, start by uh, giving you uh, giving some information to you about my PhD studies. I started my PhD studies about eight months ago in April, and uh, I'm a member of Peri DevOps project. My research focus is about uh, test automation and industrial software security, and I proud to have uh, my supervisors uh, as uh, Dr. Ed Dr. Edward Kyle Enoyo as my main supervisor, and also Kirsten Vasif as my co-supervisors. Uh, my main research question in my PhD studies is how to bring effective automated test case generation, uh, automated test generation and execution to industrial PLC software for finding faults and vulnerabilities. Uh, right now, we are working on a comparative uh, study on test automation frameworks for PLC systems in Codesys ID. 
And uh, actually, we use the hybrid methodology in uh, this study. We, we use a combination of uh, gray literature review and industrial case study. Uh, in this uh, study, and also on the whole, we are more focused on codices ID because of several reasons. The first reason is the, the codices ID is free. It is PLC manufacturer independent ID. So every uh, PLC vendor can use this uh, actually ID to develop the code. It is widely used in industry and it is uh, it supports all programming languages of uh, IEC 611.31 standard, including function block diagram, structured text, CFC, ladder, and SFC. And one of the uh, very DevOps uh, industry partners, ABB, is also using this uh, ID to develop their codes. Uh, in this paper, we uh, actually detected some uh, important features to be considered uh, when we want to make the comparison between the test automation tools of policies. And we categorize them uh, based on uh, several categories like the company uh, constraints, such as cost, supported pl platforms, and easy to installation. And also maturity, maturity of the tool, like the industrial use or a stage of development. We have some other categories uh, in our paper, like testing functionalities, uh, tool flexibility, and usability. Uh, here's a, a bigger picture of the, our hybrid methodology. In this comparison paper, it will start by the one on the top. You can see that we have the codices ID. It is our focus ID. Then we perform a GLR, a gray literature review, uh, to detect the test automation tools of codices. Uh, and by this, we want to consider the pract industry practitioner's point of view, uh, which is usually uh, published online in forums and uh, other online discussion uh, rooms. So after detecting the test automation tools of codices through GLR, we actually did a literature review to detect the important features of uh, these test automation tools to be considered and uh, to be uh, considered to make the comparison. Uh, and after detecting these features and uh, citing the source of uh, extraction, we just evaluated them by uh, asking the engineers of ABB uh, automation company to validate the important test. And after gathering the final list of uh, the important features, we uh, conducted the tool comparison between these tools. And finally, we evaluated the functionality of these tools by applying them on an uh, industrial case study that is provided to us by a famous uh, uh, automation company, which is ABB, uh, automation company of Sweden. Uh, and finally, we have the automated test and the results in the paper. And uh, actually, after uh, finishing this work, which is in the, I can say, uh, in the final state, then we have a future work, uh, which is uh, ongoing actually right now. And uh, we want to create the first search-based codices compatible automated test case generator for PLC programs. So we want to detect the fault and vulnerabilities of developed PLC programs using an automated approach based on the Penguin test, uh, automated test case generator. Penguin is the uh, first, and I can say uh, is the only uh, actually Python-based automated test case generator uh, for uh, regular uh, Python programs, but we want to uh, uh, actually uh, apply it on PLC programs to uh, detect, uh, to generate automated uh, effective test uh, cases for PLC programs. Here's a bigger picture of uh, what we want to do. In the uh, first step, we have the, uh, we have a FPD program, which is usually uh, in the XML extension. Uh, then we want to uh, uh, first manually and then automatically generate a Python file uh, based on that uh, XML program. We want to convert the PLC program to a Python file, and after that we we want to Feed, uh, feed it to, a, to Penguin to automatically generate test cases for it. After having the test cases, we will uh, actually feed it to codices and automatically test the, generate the required test cases. And uh, 
in uh, as you might know in uh, in xml file we have input output and tags which should be mapped to a python code uh, in a proper way and it is another contribution of uh, our future work thank you for your time uh, and uh, i'm available for any possible questions uh, okay uh, thank you uh, mikhail um um, um yeah i just uh, wondering so it, it, at some point you uh, you talked about comparing various um, um uh, frameworks for test automation right yeah. and so uh, you can yeah, I, I saw a number of um uh, features right um, yes so 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 uh, what's the conclusion of this part of your study so uh... actually in this study we wanted to uh, first of all, discover the most discussed test automation tools of uh, codices based, uh, based on considering the uh, practitioner's point of view, the industry practitioners, because they are, the, they are playing the main role in this area. And after that, we try to propose them and also compare the features and limitations of uh, available test automation frameworks of codices. Uh, so we uh, actually extra extracted the uh, important features using a literature review on the related works, and then we, ev we validated these uh, features using the help of ABB. To, to uh, I asked we asked them to uh, validate the important features from their point of view. Uh, and after uh, making this comparison uh, on the uh, code assistance automation tools and uh, introducing their features and their limitations, uh, we, uh, we evaluated their applicability on a real world industry case study by applying them on uh, a super a current supervision uh, PLC program of uh, AB. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, did you compare several, uh, uh, several, uh, let's say, frameworks? Uh, and so, yes, you, you chose uh, actually, the best one. Uh, so, uh, no, uh, actually, what's the conclusion? We, mm -hmm. The test uh, frameworks that we uh, detected through GLR, performing the Gray Literature Review, the test uh, automation frameworks are uh, Codices Test Manager and also CO Unit. These are the most discussed and uh, also most famous and reliable. Test automation of uh, of codices ID and both tools are actually verified by codices ID. So uh, these are the test. These two uh, test automation tools are the uh, test automation tools that we are focused on in this paper. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay. And so uh, based on this information, what's what's your uh, what's your let's say conclusion? So take take the weight. So so. Uh, using that, um, you would use that uh, for development of your framework. Uh, so, so, so how would you use this information from the study? Uh, actually, it is the first step uh, uh, of my study to first discover these uh, test automation tools. Mm -hmm. And in our future work, uh, when we want to actually, uh, we want to develop a Python-based mm -hmm automated test generator for PLC programs. Uh, mm -hmm. In the final step, when we generated the test cases for uh, FPD programs, we can uh, use this uh, actually test automation tools to automatically uh, execute these test cases on the, the FPD program in uh, Codesys ID. So mm -hmm. that would be the use case of this study in our uh, the next study, actually, in our future. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions from the audience? Mm, uh, I have uh, probably one uh, last question. So you mentioned uh, this translation to Python from uh, PLC code, right? So, but uh, what I understand you 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 meant is this you found this you have this functional block diagrams, right? Yes. Uh, that, it, that you somehow translate to Python um how it is done because i think this is kind of one of the most important steps in your in your framework uh, uh yes that's a really good question actually this study is just uh, a concept and we just started thinking about it so it is in initial states uh, but uh, actually uh, the fpd programs uh, you, uh, can be exported as an xml file 
and we have to actually uh, analyze the different parts of an XML file to be able to uh, efficiently convert them to a Python code. For example, in an XML file, we have different sections like the inputs and their values, outputs, tags, and other information. So the first step for us would be to have a good interpretation of an XML file and its, uh, its in the different, uh, actually, uh, parts. Then we can actually develop a Python code to automatically uh, uh, fetch this uh, kind of features uh, and also this kind of information and uh, then transform them to a Python code. Mm -hmm. So uh, this this would be our first challenge. Uh, and uh, uh, I hope with analyzing these uh, XML files, we can uh, actually achieve this uh, important transformation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so, any questions uh, from the audience or comments? Okay, Mikhail, thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, I, I think we'll be all interested to know results of your work in the future. Um, so our next presenter would be Damir. Damir, are you ready? Yes. Yes, I am. Uh, let me just try to share my screen. Okay. Uh, just a moment. Uh, let's see. Can you just share the PowerPoint? Okay. Do you see that? The... Yes. Yes, you can see that. Okay, it's full screen, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Okay. Perfect. So, hello everyone. I am Damir Bilic, uh, PhD student at Maladarin University, and maybe I can do this as well so people can see me. Yeah. Hello. I am Damir Bilic, a PhD student at Maladarin University, and my research is mainly focused on. Uh, well, my, my PhD thesis is kind of around product line engineering and the current study that, that would be quite interesting for the DevOps is about system evolution, I think at least, would, uh, is about uh, system evolution in product lines. So uh, first, uh, uh, well, a small introduction what product lines are. So in product lines, the idea is basically to, to not build like if you have you know a family of similar products like for example like in, in the uh, an example from a previous project is uh, uh, this heavy machinery like excavators you know haulers and different machines where you have a bunch of similar machines that are built uh, at, the, at one company in the same premises and so on so you know you don't want to build, build each of them individually but the idea is to you know build them based by by using reusable assets so and the idea in product line is that you know you have a bunch of reusable assets that you can just put together to build to to get any product that you want so and then you get you know just a feature selector where you have options that you can change so like we can change the propulsion and we can change the attachment and then like if you do this then like the wheels change to i mean the the, the crawlers change to wheels and i don't know that we can get like a demolition hand instead of a bucket and also i mean that that also has to be specified in requirements. So if you like look, look up here, the, these things are changing depending what, what options you have. So th th that's kind of the idea behind product lines, basically to build products with by, by kind of building for reuse and then just configuring uh, the, the final applications instead of, uh, uh, instead of building one by one. And then also an illustration here is a, uh, or, or this is kind of the main principles in, in product lines is that you have a, a variability model, often a feature model, which describes the, the variable parts of this of the system. Like we have, I don't know, feature A and B here and some constraints between them. And then you have a, a in the, then you have a, the, the system itself in the solution domain where you have, you know, a core, which is same for all systems. And then, you know, a mapping between kind of the description of the features and, and the, their, their implementation. And then, the idea is that you just get pick something here and then it automatically generates the final system. So you don't have to do kind of anything in between, but you know, just developing this big reusable assets, which is not easy. But anyway, so that's the idea behind product lines. But now the challenge is about uh, the evolution of these systems. And uh, uh, there are two options on, on kind of main, main options, how we can evolve these systems. And, 
So, and and then let, let's let's go through both of them here. So, you start with the product line. So you have a core, and you have some you know reusable features that you can put on the core, and then they can be configured in different ways. And then uh, uh, one option when you need a product that does does not exist in the product line, you can either making make it by changing the product line. So for example, you need let's say you need this variant B, and like variant b has this green part which does not exist in the product line so what you can do is you can change the product line you know add the green part and then add, then you can generate variant b and then you, you see like it has the core which has changed and then it has two features so that's one option and that's kind of the ideal option another option is to you know you need maybe variant a 1.1 like with you know stuff that has some more like some some stuff that has changed so instead of changing it in the product line you change it, you get the closest possible uh, system variant that you can get, get to the one that you need. And then you change it, you know, just that single product without, you know, changing a, a bunch of like, or without changing the, the, the reu reusable assets that can affect many products, you just change one. So then you, you don't have to worry about affecting all the other product once, products once you, make, once you make the change. And this second approach where you just change kind of you get one one variant and then you just change it instead of the product line is at least like uh, from from our discussions with with different industries and then also reading the literature is the most common approach used. But once you change a variant here, it kind of gets detached from the product line because you know there is no mapping between these features and and they have changed so you know how do you handle that and then the idea is to make these things again reusable you have to merge it back into the product line but the question is how do you merge it because if the, the same thing changes here and here you get merge conflicts you know and how do you resolve them well you resolve them by doing a lot of manual analysis and and, and that's it but still merging them you know uh, uh takes a lot of effort and the thing is that the changes you make here you know might make it impossible to merge it so if you you know do something that will violate some other other features then you don't really want to merge it back because you kind of lose the variability space or you might uh, uh, introduce inconsistencies so that you can you know generate uh, faulty products even though the merge is successful. So you can, I don't know, like, uh, for example, get, you know, a car without wheels be just because you don't have, I don't know, the proper constraint set or there is like a, a constraint uh, a conflict or something like that. So the second option is the most common one, but it's also kind of the more problematic one. So what we try in this work is basically trying to address that. And uh, what we do is we have uh, defined uh, uh, a graph, yet another language, a graph which is a uh, uh, feature dependency graph. Basically, we use it to 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 abstract from the system implementation or any asset or any, any artifact of the system can be a system design or even requirements or the actual implementation like code or whatever. We generate a, a, a dependency graph, so where we abstract. Uh, artifacts so either you know can be from code can be classes or i don't know from models can be again classes or or or, or blocks or whatever modeling language to use or you use or it, it can be even you know individual statements depending which level of detail you need you 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 need you want to analyze and then we we basically have two types of relations between the artifacts it's like containment so like you know one artifact artifact like i don't know a uh, an operation is contained within a within a block or within a, a class and then relations like those can be i don't know interfaces between classes or 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 some some kind of relations or any kind of relations that you that you want and then you, i mean you can you can give them uh, uh, you can have more relation types if you want or or you know you can you can have uh, uh, you can make these even more concrete if you want but basically, the, the artifacts are also mapped to, to features or the common part. But anyway, we extract these feature dependencies and artifact depend dependencies and through them the feature dependencies of, of like, the, like the dependencies between these. Like 
the the the, the what kind of we, we extract we take the system and then we get the dependencies between these features and the core and how they how they uh, uh, are combined together by using this uh, basically we kind of abstract it through this dependency graph and this this is a snippet from from a pick and place unit which is a benchmark for such a revolution and it's available here and they provide models source code plc source code so it's a very very nice uh, benchmark so but what we do we are we, we extract these and then we compare the the feature dependency graphs instead of comparing the, the artifacts at different levels like you know comparing code comparing the system models and i mean comparing them can be quite tricky because comparing these graphical models is is always an issue but you know abstracting it to something which which is kind of formalized then it's a bit easier to do it but we still rely on on you know either a, 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 a the name or or a, or a identifier for every artifact to basically to match and 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 compare uh, and find the differences between you know the differences between the product line and, and the and the variant that has changed and that has been disconnected from the product line and once we have those then we can analyze uh, uh, analyze the differences and see how we can combine these uh, 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 let's say if you have i don't know changes in the product line and changes in the variant so then we can assess how we can you know put them back together with while while maintaining consistency so making sure that you cannot really derive any broken systems like uh, i don't know uh, uh, like we we have i mean there are rules so like for example that every i don't know uh, uh, attribute needs to have a, a type or something like that so you cannot have untyped attributes or some you know such such consistencies and then also we maintain the variability space so we make sure that once the merge is done it still must be possible to derive you know every existing variant from the product line so yeah that's what we do and then we also propose how to how to change the feature model itself so like the 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 the, the feature description and the relations between them so based on these changes you know you might add a new feature maybe an optional maybe some feature had to change the the their the, the constraints and so on so and this is from a static level so we just look at you know code like some kind of static analysis we just look at the code and we look at models and and not yet at requirement diagrams but uh, uh, one one in one aspect that we are interested in is uh, um, uh, is looking into whether the uh, dependencies are equivalent at different abstraction levels when when making the system so you know the depends dependencies between the features and the and whatever system parts you find in requirement documents are they equivalent to the dependencies in the in the system model or or you know are they even similar are they the same or are they totally different so what what what's the difference between them and then also uh, uh same with the code and i mean it can be i guess it can be an equivalence question here between the requirement specification and the code you know it can the system model can be omitted if you want but anyway so we are interested in in checking whether uh, uh these are equivalent or not and and, and uh, uh, uh yeah and then try trying to you know see make conclusions whether whether you can predict these uh, uh, the problems you know once you do let's say once you change the requirements for this new variant to implement these new changes can you predict that you know it will have specific consequences because if these are equivalent you know in at, at any stage then you can kind of do it but if you are if they are not then then it's really hard and then you have to rely on domain knowledge so kind of i, I guess a, a question per, perhaps related to the the presentation from 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 olga and and i, I forgot the other name the, the, that was earlier was uh, 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 how do we extract the dependencies from textual requirements? So maybe, maybe I don't know, Andre, if 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 so, some of the work that you do with with uh, with uh, machine learning could be used to to extract well, perhaps to map requirements to features because also the the requirements are often not really annotated with features. Like we have feature information here and here. 
and, and I mean, that's needed to, to, to have, you know, a, a function product line, but here it's not always there. So can we kind of map by using, by looking at, I don't know, the previous uh, requirements specifications, can we map the requirements to certain features and, and how do we extract the dependencies saying that, you know, if you have feature A, then feature B has to also, has also be, also needs to be enabled. So can we, you know, get these dependencies or can we get these relations uh, between them by, by looking at the textual requirements? So I guess that's, that's a question for you, Andre, if, if you think that that could be something, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, um, yeah, so it's definitely not for Rufina and Olga um, uh, questions. Uh, so we have uh, Nikita, who will be presenting after you, uh, he would work on, on, on LP uh, subject and on clustering in particular. Uh, however, we are not on this kind of level when we define, um, let's say, relation dependencies. Uh, we, we, def we, we actually look at similarities. Um, um of various requirements but not necessarily on kind of interdependencies uh, yeah. for that i guess there is a different techniques need, need to be done so um one maybe kind of as a brainstorming idea so in rq code and what ildar topic is about uh when you have object oriented requirements uh then we actually can add some kind of generalization interfacing rules among requirements uh, that's actually maybe maybe something uh, some source of information for dependencies um, yeah. as a natural code, let's say. Uh, so that's going to be much more transparent, let's say, and traceable. Okay. Um, also, um, in terms of um, uh, topic, I mean, I, in the topic I saw that you will be dealing somehow with CI CD uh, DevOps thing um to, so currently uh, so it, i mean uh, you meant actually evolution right so yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so uh like how a variant can leave this product line uh through evolution so we will um, evolve we evolve uh, variants and see how this uh, can be merged to the product line yes. and, and back and forth okay i see i see okay yeah, yeah good interesting um yeah. so um, any comments or questions from the audience yeah so i i have i actually ah, have yeah, another, yeah. or another another i mean something else that that we also look into is mm -hmm. or or that that we kind of thought about was mm -hmm. the behavior so i mean this is a, a it's not a very nice graph but if you think about this as a state machine where where you have you know a, a state machine of this of well it's just one part of the of this pick and place unit benchmark. So this is one version, this is another version. And to make them a product line, you, you have to do something like this to support also basically putting them together to support uh, basically to still be able to derive both systems uh, 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 at the same time. So I'm, or I mean to support, you know, to be able to generate this and this, but I mean, this is just an, uh, just a, a thought. It's nothing that we did work on for now, but we, we plan to. So, can we like can we make sure that you know that 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 this actually that that is actually true? So, like that the properties that we're holding for this system, you know, and this system still hold hold inside here, and then that you cannot get any. Uh, uh, any unexpected behavior. So can we say that, you know, this state machine implements only these two, so like nothing else. So can we, I mean, the, the question is what properties do you check if you do some kind of model checking? And so can we kind of, uh, and I mean, I have no idea about like what kind of properties those could be, but can we extract, you know, properties from here automatically that must hold here and then also from here while making sure that you know, for example, if you look at security require or, or well, I don't know much about you know security, but uh, if you have some kind of some security requirements, will they be violated once you put these two uh, state machines together? Maybe I, I I don't know because yeah, you you get you know you might be because like here you can 
if you if you take this transition you can avoid kind of this state or you know this state or this state but maybe that's not really allowed uh, uh, from a security perspective so mm -hmm. so can we kind of somehow check these things or not yeah that 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 could be an interesting you know once you put them together or you know that could be an interesting thing to look into mm -hmm. okay yeah, I, I guess some of the, uh, our techniques should, should actually deal with this kind of thing. So we, you of the system and whether the requirements still hold or not. So that's yeah. yeah so this is there's, there's definitely something of interest for the very dose project. Right. Yeah. So if someone wants to look at these models, I can. Well, if you just Google X X uh, X P P U, you will find a GitHub link to this pick and place unit, which is quite interesting. So if somebody wants like these models, th th there's a bunch of UML models and also PLC code and like 20 iterations of the PLC code. So I can provide you the link if you want. I, I think it's also on some slide. Yeah. If you Google this, you will find this uh, a pick and place unit. So yeah, if someone is interested to, to just, you know, discuss this further, um, yeah, I'm available. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, any comments, any uh, um, questions from the audience? Uh, yes, I have uh, a question about the composition, yes, uh, this last slide. Yes. Yeah, it, what kind of composition rule you have defined it? So, so I mean, right, right now, this is like a, a, a basically we find the differences between them and just we just you know add the differences from one to the other and then we we take also i mean this we uh, we we kind of copy the states and the tra transition from these states and then we just on the transitions we say that you know if feature a is enabled these transitions are enabled if, if feature b is enabled these transitions are uh, enabled and the others are kind of disabled so you cannot you cannot get to them but it's it's a simple copy and paste as of now. Yeah. So, but apparently, because if you look, uh, you are thinking in doing model checking, you have the same pass um, in the composite that you can find in the component. No? Yes. Yes. Then, there, yes. There are. Then maybe it's possible to conclude that you will find the same uh, properties, but news yeah. maybe. Yeah, it might be. But like another thing is that. Uh, uh, it would be interesting to to simplify these uh, uh, state machines, because, for example, they can be simplified. You can remove this transition, and then you can, you know, get a direct transition down here. Because it, it, looking at the system, it doesn't really matter. So, if we do that, can we still ensure that the the the, the properties hold that we're holding in the, in this? So, so I mean, yeah, I guess it would be also be another step that we we first simplify this and then then we check whether the properties yeah. hold. Okay. Uh, I have a question, uh, Yuri Wine from Obo Academy Group. <clears throat> maybe first uh, comment. Uh, I think maybe you can actually look at these um, component. Uh, conjunction operators in in multi-view contract theory because there is there is a, <clears throat> a theoretical background how to verify this kind of uh, it's it's called actually conjunction of of uh, components and it should satisfy conjunction of the contracts uh, view contracts basically yeah uh, this is this is one comment and uh, i have also a question <clears throat> It is about consistent. Uh, sorry, about uh, similarity metrics. So what uh, what uh, similarity metrics you use uh, when you compare uh, the concepts or features? Yeah. So in, so right in, now, uh, yeah. Right, right now, it's well, the, the unique identifier and the and the uh, uh, relations. So, kind of the, the the node in the graph owns the outgoing uh, um, edges. So it is that. Kind of the similarity is, is is based on on that the unique identifier can be even a name and and the the structure it's it's basically a structure uh, structure based uh, similarity yeah. yes 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 okay nothing nothing to do with ontologies yeah. or, or uh, no okay. Mm -hmm. okay thank you
Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we have to move uh, thank you. to last, our last presentation. Uh, Nikita, are you ready? Yes, sure. Yes, please um, share your screen and you can go on with the presentation. Okay. Can you hear me? Do you see the screen? Yes, yes, that's fine. Thank you. Good. Uh, so let's start. Uh, my name is Nikita Tikhonov. Uh, I am from Minneapolis University, and my uh, thesis topic is software security requirements and uh, clustering using deep learning. And so, uh, in this presentation, we are going to talk about my uh, my motivation, like uh, why, what is the reason for me to do my project, uh, the problem, like what are the current problems in the field of security requirements and like software requirements in general. We will look at this current current state of the art. So I will like gently introduce you into the NLP. Uh, after that, we will discuss uh, the plan of my research and uh, in the end, I will tell you about the evaluation of my uh, of the results. So let's start. Uh, as you can see on the slide, there is a, a graph, uh, there is a plot of uh, the most uh, like the top uh, causes for project failures. And as you can see, if we will look closer, one of the top reasons, actually top two, is the inaccurate requirements gathering. So uh, requirements engineering is uh, one of the most important uh, thing uh, uh, if we are talking about uh, project uh, development. Uh, so, and in particular, if we are talking security requirements, uh, each group of the requirements uh, needs its own specialist setting and of course uh, architectural solutions uh, in order to be introduced to, into the system. And additionally, uh, developers uh, for, forget about uh, security and focus more on the functionality of the system. And then uh, this uh, turns out uh, into the vulnerabilities in the system, which leads to leaks uh, of the user's data, for example, or uh, co company's data. Uh, so um, what is the main problems in, in the field of security requirements? Uh, and the requirements engineering. So firstly, uh, requirements engineering is not automatic. So it involves a lot of uh, human uh, power. Uh, we need to have uh, like uh, a specialized person, uh, a requirements engineer for it, uh, or maybe a couple of people to uh, like to only cope with the requirements for our project. Uh, second thing is that uh, there is no strict definition uh, of requirements classes, uh, especially for security requirements. So uh, each, uh, each, even each stakeholder can have its own view uh, on the different classes of software requirements, which leads to, to ambiguities in, in documentation and then uh, incorrect implementation of these requirements. Uh, the third thing is that uh, we use natural language for requirements documentation. And uh, obviously a natural language can be understood uh, differently by different people, uh, which again can lead to ambiguities and incorrect implementation of the requirement. Uh, the next thing is that we do not, uh, we do not have a proper research in the field of security requirements because it is quite narrow field. And uh, uh, in particular, with the autom automation of security require of auto automation of analysis of security requ requirements, uh, we cannot uh, like find uh, 
a lot of good papers to analyze them and to get some information about security requirements. And finally, uh, as a data scientist, uh, we cannot find clean and big data sets for our models, uh, for our uh, an for analysis, because uh, just uh, it is quite complicated to create them. And again, it has a lot of uh, problems with the natural language and ambiguities uh, of it. So uh, let's talk about uh, state of the art in the requirements analysis. Uh, of course, uh, when we are talking about requirements, uh, mostly we are talking about the text. And uh, for the text, we have NLP, which is an uh, automatic, um, it can be named uh, as automatic manipulation of natural language by software. Uh, so what uh, do we do with NLP? We can classify text, uh, for example, uh, filter spam in our email, predict whether this particular uh, message is spam or not. We can translate uh, from one language to another. We can uh, produce summarization of a text or generate text, uh, for example, uh, for online bots, um, which we can communicate with customers by themselves. And um, and after that, I want to introduce you like some definitions of NLP. And the first definition will be a text embedding. We already had it uh, during the previous presentation, but I want to focus on it again. Uh, so what is text embedding? Text embedding is some numerical representation of any text, uh, word, sentence, or article. And of course, when we are talking about machines, uh, machines uh, does not uh, understand our languages and they need to have some representation um, to uh, work with it, to uh, analyze it, uh, to, cal to perform calculation on it. And for this, uh, we need to have embeddings. And as you can see in the picture, uh, there is an example for word embeddings. Uh, you can see that uh, we can encode for example, cats, dogs, and houses, uh, uh, and then we get a seven-dimensional embedding, and which can be then projected to the uh, two-dimensional space. And as we can see, uh, cats, uh, cat, and kitten uh, are together because uh, their latent representation uh, uh, are closer to each other than for example, dog and houses, and the same with king and queen. But as you can see, we can also preserve uh, the semantic uh, similarity between uh, not only uh, the sex of the people, but also like, I don't know, uh, position of the people like in hierarchy. For example, king and queen are together uh, and men and women also together, but uh, the similarity between man and king and woman and queen also preserved in the embedding. So, and the next thing about uh, NLP is uh, transfer learning. Uh, it is a technique which uses one model uh, that was previously trained on one task uh, in the second task. Uh, so first model usually is big and it was trained on a more general task. For example, uh, you already heard about BERT. Uh, BERT uh, has had two tasks of mask language modeling, which is uh, just to, which is prediction of a mask word in a sentence and next sentence prediction, um, which means uh, like it will, tell whether this particular sentence uh, can be the next sentence, can be after the current sentence or not. And for this, uh, for the first uh, model, we need usually a lot of data. For example, BERT was trained on a 3.3 billion word corpus. Uh, and for the second task, we usually need much less data and spend much less time training it. 
for example, but usually it is still a lot of data, like a couple hundreds of thousands of words. Uh, so let's go to the uh, to the current situation in NLP. As you can see, uh, uh, machine learning uh, started to be like uh, leading uh, leading direction in NLP quite recently. Uh, firstly, it started with uh, word embeddings, uh, for example, Wordaway, Glow, Fast Text, and then it is started to focus on text and sentences, uh, which is um, transformers, BERT, and uh, uh, Elmo is actually also focused on the word embedding, but I, in current presentation, wanted to focus more on the transformer and BERT. And actually, uh, transformers, uh, which is a different, which is completely new, um, direction in machine learning and deep learning uh, now are state of the art in the whole NLP. And what is a transformers? Uh, transformers are models that utilize architecture from attention is all you need paper and like named after the model transformer from this paper. And like what is the main concept in these transformers? Uh, these transformers utilize attention, as you can guess. And what is attention? Uh, attention is a technique that mimics, mimics cognitive attention. Uh, so it will try to put focus on the most important words in a sentence uh, while uh, trying to predict other words or something like that. Uh, and on the picture, you can see uh, French uh, sentence Je t'aime, which means I love you in English, and it is visible that uh, we, if we are talking about Je, which means I, it will put focus on the I uh, word in the uh, English language, as well as Tiamo te is you, Ama is uh, love, and it is it turned out to be uh, quite useful uh, and uh, um, most of the uh, modern models utilize this technique and uh, produce uh, amazing results in different fields, for example, uh, question answering, uh, machine translation, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, so what do we have right now? Um, after the transformers, there were many models that were based uh, on the transformer. Uh, and like improved it, made it better, beat other models in benchmarks. For example, trans some, tra some transformer race models are T5, XLNet, and BERT. And actually, BERT was so good that uh, scientists started to research uh, functionality of BERT and uh, uh, published uh, improved versions of BERT. And, uh, for example, you heard already about SBERT, uh, which is sentence embeddings and other uh, improved versions. Uh, so BERT is also one of the main focuses uh, in uh, modern machine learning and NLP. And the next thing is uh, one of the examples uh, from uh, requirements engineering uh, research or oh, using BERT is a uh, Norbert. Uh, so Norbert was used for classification of requirements and it, it turned out to be very good. Uh, it, it beats all the previous models. Uh, however, uh, the data set uh, which was used for the analysis for the benchmark is uh, cannot be uh, it cannot be said that uh, it is quite representative because it has only 625 functional and non-functional requirements and as i told you we need like a couple of hundreds of thousands of words uh, uh, sentences uh, to fine-tune uh, our model and so 
The next thing is, uh, of course, text clustering. But actually, the most important thing is that uh, we need to firstly have uh, good features for our clustering algorithm to work. Because if uh, our features are not good, we cannot produce meaningful clusters. So everything uh, right now uh, depends on the model for um, text embeddings, which, uh, which, which model I will use or like, uh, which technique uh, I will use for feature uh, to produce the features. And my plan, uh, for the research is firstly and the most uh, first is and the most important thing is to create a data set of security requirements because currently uh, there is not not so much data and uh, I don't think that uh, with this amount of data I can produce some meaningful results uh, using uh, modern uh, machine learning approaches. So we need to uh, analyze uh, uh, documents with requirements. We need to extract uh, requirements that are security requirements and then uh, fine tune our model in order to produce uh, uh, some embeddings of these security requirements. Uh, after that, I will of course try different models because there are many models uh, uh, and uh, each model can perform differently. And of course, I will try different clustering techniques. Um, those, are, those are some uh, examples of uh, clustering techniques. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, I then will assess performance and how. Uh, of course, uh, we need to firstly analyze the clusters by some metric. And uh, one of the important, one of the most important metrics is elbow metric. Uh, it is used for determining uh, uh, how much clusters do you need in your data, uh, like uh, for your data in order for it to be meaningful, but like not uh, extensive. For example, if you have uh, 1 million of clusters, of course, uh, it will be, it will produce uh, a, small distance between each of the class, each of the center of cluster, but uh, it will be meaningless for, for us, for, uh, for people. And the other thing is silhouette score, which means like how clusters are separated and how far each cluster from each other cluster is. And then I will try to visualize our clusters and uh, present it to the specialist and specialists will uh, analyze them and tell me whether it is useful clustering or not. So I think that's it. Uh, I'm ready to answer your questions. Okay, thank you, Nikita. Um, any questions from the audience? Anyone? Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Nikita. I guess uh, we can end at this point. So we saw uh, several very interesting uh, uh, presentations. Uh, some of them are uh, somehow related in terms of technologies used or topics uh, addressed. So I actually encourage everyone to cooperate uh, because I guess working together on the similar topics, relevant topics, is uh, is uh, uh, one of the better ways to encourage research and uh, have a better results at the end. So uh, I believe you'll continue these uh, types of seminars, and we'll have another one uh, towards March or April uh, when we'll discuss uh, more about the results. Right, um, with that, I thank you very much for joining us. And if you have any questions, you can always ask uh, your supervisor or anyone, me. Um, and um, I wish you a very nice day and goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, goodbye. Bye -bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you.